Well, thank you, uh, DPM. I'm sure that uh, all of you here would appreciate the comprehensiveness of DPM's insights as to where are we now at, where is Singapore heading to, and what are the challenges that Singapore has to continue to face, and what can we do about it. So here is the opportunity to ask DPM questions, raise your concerns, as the man is right here. Now, I will, while you're thinking about the questions, let me just uh, ask one question of DPM while you prepare your questions, right? DPM, you have not touched on, I think, a very important problem, which is a perennial problem in Singapore. And that is our very low fertility rate. The fertility decline is really shocking, but we understand in other countries, they also face the same problem. But I think it's particularly more acute in the case of Singapore because our population base is actually smaller. And so, as you know, when your fertility decline, it impacts a lot of things down the chain for Singapore. For example, manpower needs, for example, support for property values, and, and so on and so forth. And we, we face a double whammy because of our aging population. So on the one hand, we have fertility decline, that means less young people, and at the same time, more old people. Now, if Singapore is going to think about moving up the technology chain, AI and so on, then if there's not enough young people, and there are a lot of old people, and difficulty in getting the old people to embrace technology, what are we going to do? So do we import, do we have more migrants? And that itself raises social concerns. So what do you think, DPM? Thanks, Houston, for that question. Uh, it is a challenge. It's not unique to Singapore. All advanced countries face this issue, uh, and we are not unique in that. But of course, as you say, be being a small country, the population challenges are more pressing for us, and the implications will be sharper. Um, we continue to look at this. There's no silver bullet. It doesn't exist because getting married, having a baby is a highly private decision. I am of the view that there is, the more you nag, doesn't mean the better the outcome. Because many of you here who are parents or grandparents having this problem, you know when you nag at your kids, the outcome is worse. In fact, they resist more, they get more frustrated at you. So rather than keep pushing at this and nagging Singaporeans about this, I feel let's just focus our efforts at creating a more conducive environment for families. What can we do from a government point of view? Make sure housing remains affordable. Make sure young couples get their homes faster. We are working very hard on that. Make sure that we have good preschool childcare facilities. I, I shared what we are doing in that regard. Uh, make sure that we have family-friendly workplaces and we are working on flexi work arrangements. We are looking at leave arrangements. We recently in this budget increased paternity leave and infant care leave and we will continue to study what more we can do. So by creating an overall environment at work and in our neighborhoods, which is family friendly. Hopefully, we will create a more conducive environment. And finally, at the end of the day, we just must have faith in our fellow Singaporeans. Let the young people make their own decisions and trust them to do the right thing. All right. That's a <clears throat> challenge for all of us. Now, the, the floor is open. I, in the interest of time, I would like to collect two or three questions so that DPM can attend to all of them. So uh, I see Professor Danny Kwa is one question. Uh, wait, wait, Danny, I'm going to... How many, who else would like to ask a second question? A se where? Oh, okay, Miss Jean, all right. And one more question, one more. Anyone else, one more question? 
Or where? Okay, so the third, the lady. Okay, so Danny, please. <clears throat> Thank you, Houston. Good evening, DPM. Thank you for the speech. You've spoken to us about lifting the broad middle. You've spoken to us about taking care of those at the bottom of the income distribution. And you've spoken to us about making sure the top of the income distribution doesn't feel disadvantaged from the things, other things that are going on. So you've told us about benefiting the entire distribution of the population. To deliver on this, we have to have growth. The only way we can get this triangulation is if the pie increases. So DPM, I'd like to hear your opinion on what the new sources of growth are going to be going forwards, given a global economy that's become more tentative, given changes in the world trading structure, given geopolitical rivalry, the global climate crisis, and a range of other factors. Where are the prospects for growth that you see for us going ahead? Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we are taking all the questions together first? Yes. Okay. Good. The second one, Jean. Thank you, DPM, for your insights insightful speech and use them for this opportunity to ask a question. Um, I have here, Straits Times just reported Singapore factory output slums 12.1% in August, biggest drop since 2019, and this is our 11th straight month of contraction. Should we be concerned? Are we heading into recession or bad times? Thank you. Okay, the third question, the lady. Where are you uh, from? Hi, my name is Jihe Lee. I'm from the Singapore Exchange. Um, I'm not Singaporean. I'm from South Korea. And we're from, I'm from an economy where there is an extremely high level of involuntary uh, unemployment within the elderly as well as within the youth. And you mentioned... Uh, the minister mentioned a government-sponsored program where uh, the government is sponsoring people that are going into full-time skill set training roles when they're in between jobs. So I would like to know whether the minister has a rough timeline for that investment to see a return in that, uh, in that particular group that are in between jobs. And roughly how much growth for the Singapore economy do you expect to get out of that investment? Okay. Thank you. Um, let me address, first of all, Jean's question. Although the three questions are all somewhat interrelated, but Jean asked immediately, what are our prospects for this year and maybe next year? Are we entering a recession? Uh, for this year, we are already in September, going into October. Uh, we think unlikely to be a recession because three quarters of the year already completed, but external demand is weak, um, so we recognize that. Inflation is starting to come down, stabilize somewhat, uh, but overall, we should still see positive growth. That's for this year. Um, we are quite confident we can still achieve that, given that most of the year has already passed. When you look ahead to 2024, it's more challenging to predict what will happen, but you can imagine, I mean, we are already seeing US economy softening, likely to happen. China's economy also not, in, not very strong, and they are, they, it faces its share of challenges. So external demand will be soft, next year. Uh, we don't expect a global recession at this stage, and because the overall global environment is not heading into a recession, we think next year will still be a year of positive growth for Singapore, for now. Um, but, you know, anything can happen. I think there are many downside risks. Uh, will there be a sharper recession in America? Will there be an escalation in the war in Ukraine? 
Will, they have knock, will this have knock-on effects on food supplies, on energy supplies? A lot of imponderables. So we are monitoring the external environment carefully. And the assurance to everyone in Singapore is if, if there is indeed a recession, we know how to deal with that. If it's a cyclical recession, we have tools, we have resources, we have the means to make sure that we ride through such a recession and emerge stronger, as we have done time and again in the past. Now, to, beyond the immediate term, I think Danny and the third question was asking about perhaps longer-term sources of growth. Where will they come from? I would say, first of all, I agree fully with uh, Professor Danny Kua that growth is of utmost importance because all the things I talked about, as I mentioned in my preamble, if we have a shrinking economy, it's very hard to do any of the things that we just highlighted. So we need the economy to grow. It won't, growth rates will not be like what it was in the last 20 years because our economy is much more developed. And so we must expect growth to slow, but we must still be able to generate positive growth and it should be growth fueled by productivity because labor inputs going to plateau and stabilize. We can't keep growing the labor force. So it really has to be growth fueled by productivity. Where will that growth come from? Well, if you look at our economy today, it is already very well diversified. In advanced manufacturing, we are still competitive in certain key areas, notwithstanding the fact that we are not a cheap place to do business, notwithstanding the active industrial policies that major powers are pursuing, but we still hold our own in certain key segments, in precision engineering, in aerospace, in biomedical science, MNC still want to come here to expand their operations and to put in new investments here, creating good jobs. So advanced manufacturing will still do well. Logistics, I think we have a lot of strengths and we are pursuing our expansion of airport and seaports in order to capture the value of logistics and transport. That's certainly another growth area. In financial services, we are doing well too. We are attracting our share of investments and capital. Green finance within in the financial services sector is a sector that's growing very rapidly, for example. So when you look across all the different key areas, key pillars of the economy, there are in fact still many opportunities. Opportunities to attract key MNCs, cutting edge, new cutting edge investments into Singapore, as well as opportunities to develop our ho own homegrown companies. And if we do all that well, then I'm confident our economy will continue to grow, not by 5, 7% as it used to, but if we are talking 2, 3, 4%, maybe 4 will be getting harder and harder to achieve, but at 3% in the next few years, it's possible and we can still achieve that kind of growth. So we have to do that and continue doing everything we can to invest in R&D, invest in innovation, invest in productivity and you know, push the innovation frontier in Singapore. So that's our basic economic strategy and we will continue pursuing it. On the point then of what, you know, the, the, the uh, investments that we put into adult education and training, into unemployment support, into all these things may take time to bear fruit. Uh, what, are, what is the return on these investments? I think the returns may not be so easily quantifiable. They may not even be short term. But if we don't even have these additional investments in human capital, it will be very hard for Singaporeans to adjust to a rapidly changing economy, to all the churn and disruptions in the workplace. So this is not something that we can um, just leave to the market. The government has to step in, recognizing that we are in a different environment and do more to provide better assurances and support for Singaporeans while continuing to uphold some basic principles 
that, that sense of self-reliance, that sense of helping one another, um, the very strong spirit of self-help in Singapore, we will continue to preserve that. And if, if we can get that balance right, maintaining these fundamental principles while strengthening our mutual support network, then we will be in a better position. Singaporeans will feel assured and importantly, there will continue to be support and trust in the system and support for the way we run our economy, an open, vibrant economy, which will give us the best chances of generating sustained growth in the long term. Thank you, DPM. Are there any last minute one question because of the interest of time? Anybody want to ask? Yes, there's a hand wave there. So we'll take that as the last question for DPM. Hello, my, my name is Charlie Jaron Wong. I'm an academic director of a Master of Science in Financial Engineering at Nanyang Business School in NTU. My question is, uh, if, is a big if, if the war between China and United States broke out, what is the, where is the stand of Singapore? And uh, whatever our stand, do we have any uh, plan when the war broke out? Sure. Well, there is, if there is a war, we hope it doesn't happen. But should such a disastrous scenario take place, a war between the two superpowers of the world, our stand is to stand for Singapore. We don't have to... We don't have to choose either party. We just take care of ourselves and our people. And we have the resources to do so. That's why we have reserves. That's why we have emergency funds. That's why we have contingency plans for these kinds of scenarios. We hope it doesn't happen. We don't want it to happen. For now, I think the likelihood of it happening is not high. But one can never tell. These things happen. Accidents happen. Miscalculations happen. So we always in Singapore prepare for the worst because we believe only the paranoid survive. Okay, so let's join me to thank DPM Wong.